and definitely uh, good candidates to be in the habitable zone and maybe have liquid oceans and things like that. It's a small but growing number. Okay. All right. So that would be, if we did it in percentages, it, what's 10 out of 5,000? So what is that? It's one out of 500. So that's still pretty low. That's like a, a fifth of 1%. Right? Yeah, but you know, but a lot of those 5,000 are ones that, that will, could be. These are, I, I, I'm given a conservative number for ones that we can say, yes, that's earth sized. Got, and got, yes, that is so there's really some in, the, in the running, in the running. And we don't Absolutely. Okay. Good. But it's Good. still big news. It's still big news when we find one. Yeah, that's why it's so exciting that, you know, it's this one that was just mentioned because like, oh, yeah, that's earth sized and it seems to be in the habitable zone. That's it's still news. If we count chimps as sort of the next smartest species to us, just just for the sake of this, for this example, we can't have a meaningful conversation with them. Think about it. Huh. And we've got 99% right. identical DNA. So if if we find another species that's sort of not as smart as us what evidence do we have that we'd be able to communicate with them or worse yet finding a species just that one percent smarter than us than we are to chimps what hope do we have of them even being able to communicate with us because our simplest thoughts would transcend our most brilliant thinkers yeah your, your example of chimps really uh, is an interesting one and it kind of illustrates that Something very recent has happened uh, here on Earth with humans that, uh, for better or worse, where we have the, these qualities of of language and culture and, and and so forth. And, you know, not just I mean, chimps, you can argue, have a kind of language, but the sort of syntactical language and ability to express abstract thoughts and all that. Maybe, you know, it's pretty it's pretty new and it underscores how unlikely it probably is that we would connect with somebody else out there who seemed like an intelligent uh, civilization, uh, but also was less um, capable than us, because, you know, it, it really illustrates that maybe we've just passed some kind of threshold. And on the other direction, yeah, so what if somebody is to us as we are to chimps? That may be possible, but it may also be that this sort of threshold is something that once you're over it, then maybe you sort of can communicate, even if you recognize that these guys are geniuses compared to us. Uh, it's an so interesting that's question. Hum, that, that's David's human ego that just got <laughs> into that sentence. Yeah, we, we, we hit that threshold and we could communicate with any intelligent species smarter than us. Right. Yeah, keep yeah. thinking that, David. Yeah. I said maybe. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe uh, we're uh, maybe we're dumb as rocks compared to just about everybody in you. the universe. I like that one. That's mine. Thank That's you. the one right, I like. There you go. Do you think this future is viable? And what steps do present-day humans need to take individually as well as on a larger scale to walk towards that goal? How can we push for science literacy globally? I, I would say in three senses, yes, I think it's possible, though not assured. Um, and that the path is not going to be smooth <laughs> between here and there, and that the the key is um, some sort of a globally enlightened um, society where we uh, guide ourselves with the recognition that we are one planetary species, uh, despite all of our wonderful differences. Just as a guiding okay. uh, force operating on our future decisions. What aspects of a planet's climate are planetary scientists looking for when evaluating planets for potential to support life? Additionally, how close do these planets need to be to Earth to look for these aspects in the planet's climate? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, 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 it's a good question. So, I mean, the basic factor that we're always very focused on is a climate in the range where water would be predominantly liquid. Earth, so much of what makes Earth the way it is, is because the climate balance is such that we live on a water planet. And that is in every cell of your body is liquid water interacting with organic molecules. So so that's the number one thing. There's enough greenhouse gases, um, in a good carbon way. dioxide. In yeah, a good exactly. Way. The, the a good amount of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water, a little methane, sulfur dioxide. These are the gases that absorb infrared radiation and make a planet warm, but not so much that you have a Venus that's just too hot for liquid water. So that that's the, the sort of prime directive, if you will, for for habitability. It's it's very difficult 
to um, tell what's in a planet's atmosphere unless it's not just distance. The geometry has to be right. If we have what we call a transiting planet, so it passes in its orbit right between us and its star, then you can look at the radiation coming from that star as it passes through the atmosphere and see how it's filtered out and what molecules are there. But it's easier to do that if you're, you know, within a few hundred light years than if you're thousands of light years. Holy but but if we, as we get better instruments um, that we want to build in the future, we'll be able to greatly expand the number of planets we can do that for.